Good morning, and welcome to Zion Lutheran Church, Torrance, California. This is our virtual worship service for Sunday, January 10th, 2021. Special welcome to our guests who are with us today that have joined us through our website in particular. If you did join us through our website, please note the link there also for our worship folder so that you can follow along our entire service. Today is a Sunday which is known as Baptism of the Lord Sunday. It's a reminder that we rejoice and we give thanks to God for the baptism of our Lord Jesus. It's also a good time to remember our own baptisms and what that means to us. And so today we'll explore that and talk a little bit more about that. And that means that our, our theme for this Sunday will be our baptism is rooted in Jesus' baptism and what his baptism means for us in our daily life. Because of that special focus today, we're going to start our service just a little bit differently. We'll be using a gathering rite on baptism. And as you'll notice in the worship folder, it's a dialogue that also is interspersed with some verses from a hymn. And as you sing those words of the hymn today, please note that the first time the music appears, there will be a brief introduction to the melody. After that, begin singing immediately when you see the music and it begins to play. Let us now begin our worship service. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. But we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit One God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord now brings his word to us, first of all, through the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 to 6. These words from Isaiah will be the basis of our meditation on God's word today. We read, Coasts and islands, listen to me. Distant peoples, pay attention. The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. He made my words like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me like a sharpened arrow. He hid me in his quiver. He said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I myself said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and futility. Yet my vindication is with the Lord, and my reward is with my God. And now, says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring back to him so that Israel might, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, It is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Here ends our first lesson. Our second lesson for today is recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 25 to 34. The setting of these words that you're about to hear is that Paul and Silas have gone to the city of Philippi where they have been cruelly beaten and thrown into the deepest dungeon of the prison. And there, during the night, they're singing God's praises. And then we hear what happens. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, There was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, 
Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Here ends our second lesson from God's word. Our verse for today, Alleluia, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Alleluia. Our gospel lesson for today is recorded in the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, reading verses 4 to 11. This is the scripture account of one of the gospels of Jesus' baptism. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the gospel of our Lord. We continue our service now with our next hymn. To Jordan's River Came Our Lord, number 89. Dear friends in Christ, the meditation that we'll have today is based on the words of Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 6. Believe on the Lord Jesus 
and you will be saved. That's what Paul and Silas told a scared jailer who was about to kill himself in despair. That's also the message that our world today needs to hear. A world that is also scared. Scared of dying of COVID-19. Scared of the violence of fellow citizens. Scared of the violence of foreign terrorists. Scared of threats of nature and disasters. Scared of domestic abuse. Scared of financial ruin and so many other things. But that very night, a little bit later, that jailer and his family were also baptized. They were baptized because Jesus had commanded his apostles to do that. He said, go and baptize. They were baptized because the scripture says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. They were baptized because God's word tells us baptism saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. How do you get a good conscience toward God? How do you get rid of that voice that's constantly bothering us with guilt and fear because of the wrong things that we've done? It's not by trying harder or being better or comparing ourselves with others. All of those things just leave us wondering, is it enough? Did I do enough, God? The only way to have a good conscience toward God is through faith in Jesus. Jesus alone lived a perfect life for us and died for us. Jesus alone can give us peace in our hearts and calm for our souls. And baptism gives us Jesus. The scriptures tell us that. The scriptures say, everyone who is baptized into Christ has been clothed with Christ. Baptism wraps Jesus around us and everything that he's done for us. Baptism is the powerful washing of the word and the water that God gives to us that washes away our sins so that that voice, that conscience, has nothing more to accuse us about. The power of baptism is defined for us today in a divine dialogue that is recorded by the Lord himself for us in the prophet Isaiah chapter 49. Our God is one God, but he is also three persons. And sometimes in the scripture, he reveals to us that he has a conversation with himself. That happens, for example, in the book of Genesis at creation, when we're told that when he created people, he said, let us make man in our image. And today in Isaiah, we encounter another divine dialogue. And it will quickly become clear to us that this divine dialogue is between God, the Father, Creator, and God, the Son, Redeemer. Now, this dialogue begins with a speaker, yet unidentified, calling to the nations. Coasts and islands, it starts out. Listen to me. Distant peoples, pay attention. The speaker must have had something pretty important that he wanted to say because he wants the coasts and the islands to listen carefully, to pay attention to what he's going to say. Now, the coasts and the islands and the distant peoples is just a way that Isaiah uses to speak about people who aren't part of Israel, people who are from a long ways away or even close by who are Gentiles, who are non-Jews. They are the audience for this dialogue that's going to take place. And what's so important? The speaker says, The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. 
The Lord, he says, called him. The Lord is that Old Testament name for our God that tells us that he's a God of love and unfailing compassion for his people. That he is the Savior God. And that Lord who wants to be the Savior of his people called this person. That is, he gave him a mission. A mission that he was to do. And this mission that he gave to him was given to him before he was even in his mother's womb. And then when he was in his mother's womb, he gave him a name that would identify his mission. How can we not see in these words the Son of God, Jesus, when he was born of the Virgin Mary? And he was given that name that is Jesus, which means Savior. And that's his mission. He is to be Savior. He is to be salvation. How is he going to carry out that mission? He goes on, He, that is the Lord, made my words like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me like a sharpened arrow. He hid me in his quiver. Those words sound so familiar, don't they? We look to the writer of Hebrews and we hear him telling us that the word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Or we think of the words that Jesus spoke that are recorded in the book of Revelation. He spoke them to the, the city of Pergamum and he said to them, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. And then just a little later he says, Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The mission that this person is going to need to carry out is not a mission that's accomplished with the weapons of war that the military uses. Its weapons are words. Words of his mouth. It is the message of this person that is going to be powerful. So powerful that it will save those who believe and cut down those who reject that message. He also said that the Lord was going to hide him in his hand, hide him in his quiver like an arrow. We don't know exactly what those words are telling us. Perhaps it means that the Lord was going to conceal them for a while. Jesus didn't come for another 700 years, and so they would be hidden for a while. Or perhaps they mean that when Jesus speaks that message, when he has those words to speak, that the Lord will protect him because many will reject those words and act violently against those words. And now we come to the first part of the actual dialogue, the divine dialogue in our text. And it begins this way. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. He is that Lord. It's the Father, Creator God, who's speaking now to his Son. And he says to his Son that his mission is that he will be servant. That's not the first time we hear about the servant of the Lord in the book of Isaiah. The first time that it came is in a section of scripture that's quoted in the New Testament specifically about Jesus. So there's no doubt that this is being spoken to Jesus. He is the one who's called the servant. His mission, therefore, has to do with submitting to God's will, to doing what the Father wants him to do. So here we have Jesus called the servant, but then he adds Israel. Why does he say Israel? He's not talking about the nation of Israel here, spiritually or physically, because this is being spoken to one who has earlier talked about my mother's womb. It's a person that he's speaking to, the God-man. And why does he call Jesus, the God-man, Israel? Because he would take Israel's place. Because God had called Israel to be his servant, but Israel never would be his servant. Israel constantly rebelled and did what God didn't want them to do. But now God is sending a servant on a mission. A servant who will do everything that Israel didn't do. He will be an obedient servant. And God will be glorified by him. 
Those words remind us of the very words that Jesus spoke the night he was betrayed. He said to his disciples, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. Jesus was about to serve the Father in the most extensive way that he would be his servant. He would carry out his will to go to the cross. And by doing that, Jesus was glorified because he was the perfect servant all the way to giving himself to death on the cross. And the Father is glorified because his Son has done exactly what he wanted him to do. And his Son has showed the world how much the Father loved him. And now we hear the response of the Son to the Father Creator's words. And it may surprise us a little bit. But I myself said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and futility. How could the Son say that the commission of the Father that he was to carry out was in vain? It was for futility. Well, you look at the anguish that the God-man experienced during his life. How he proclaimed the message that God gave him to, to proclaim to the world of his love and the world rejected him. The people rejected him. The leaders of his people rejected him. Even his family rejected him. Remember one time how Jesus expressed his anguish when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to take you under my wings, but you were not willing. Jesus expended himself for people as their servant. We see how completely he used up his strength, how completely he spent himself in the Garden of Gethsemane when he cries out in anguish and his intensity is so severe that we're told he sweat and the sweat was like drops of blood running down his face. Jesus used every ounce of energy, every bit of strength trying to, to carry out our salvation for us. And for what? So that he could be rejected so that people would consider him nothing more than a common crook, even though he came to save them. So Jesus cries out in anguish to his Father, and yet he hopes and trusts and submits himself to the Father to be with him. And now the Father Creator responds to his Son's anguish. But first we're reminded that he formed him in the womb to be his servant, reminding us that he is the God-man, that he is able to, to spend himself because he is one of us. He has taken our flesh and blood and he can suffer and die like us so he can take our place. And he did this so that he could bring back Jacob, that he could gather Israel. In other words, that he could once again bring that Israel that he'd rejected God, those who trusted in him, who repented and believed, bring them back into the family. And as he did that, as he spent himself to carry that mission out, he acknowledges that God is his strength and he will see to it that he carries out his mission. But then come the Father's words. Words which are the surprise of this whole revelation, this whole dialogue. Listen to what the Father says. It is not enough for you to be my servant raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. It is not enough, the Father says. It is not enough, it is too small a thing for you to do just this. My grace is too great for just redeeming Israel and bringing back those who will repent from those descendants of Abraham. My grace is so great that I want to make the work of my son even greater. He will be for all the people. He will be for all nations. And what will he be? He will be salvation to the ends of the earth. 
Friends, Jesus isn't just a substitute for Israel. He is a substitute for us, for all people, for men, for women, for children, for Jews, for Gentiles, for Americans, for Africans, for Japanese, for Europeans, and everyone else. Because Jesus is the substitute for all. He lived a perfect life for all of us and died for all of our sins and so became our salvation. That's why when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, we hear the Father's voice from heaven saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. But wait, why did Jesus need to be baptized? He didn't have any sins to wash away. Because he's our substitute. And we needed our sins washed away. Because you and I needed to hear the Father in heaven say to us, These are my children with whom I am well pleased. You know, when Jesus came to John the Baptist, at first, the other Gospels tell us John resisted because he knew what baptism was. It was for sinners. But Jesus said to him, it's okay. We'll do this to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, it's what they need. It means I'm being their substitute. Here at his baptism, this dialogue was being carried out as the Lord anointed and appointed his son to be that servant now, to take on his mission and carry it out for us all. And that's how Jesus became our salvation, the salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's why Jesus sent his disciples to baptize all nations. Because all nations receive Jesus in baptism. They receive salvation. So don't be afraid, friends. <laughs> don't be afraid of, the ter- afraid of the terrors of this life because you have been baptized. Don't let your conscience trouble you and cause you guilt anymore because your sins have been washed away. Because God has made a pledge to you in baptism. A pledge to save you. And we know that to be true because God has told it to us himself in this divine dialogue that he recorded for our comfort in the 49th chapter of Isaiah's prophecy. In this divine dialogue, he defines for us what baptism, our baptism, means for us. Amen. We continue our service by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed printed for you in your worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As indicated in our worship folder, at this time in our service, we are offering ourselves now to God, first through our physical monetary offerings, and then also now through our prayers. So let us offer our prayer now to the Lord and come to his throne of grace. Following our prayer of the church, we'll join in praying our Lord's Prayer printed for you 
in the worship folder. Let us pray. O Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in thanksgiving and praise. We thank you for revealing yourself at the baptism of Jesus, your Son. There you declared the one born at Bethlehem and adored by the Magi to be your dearly loved Son in whom you are well pleased. Enable all of us to find in him our hope and salvation. As you anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit, so pour out that same Spirit on us that we may serve you in the world. Take from us all the fear and doubt of this world. Overcome our laziness and indecision and drive the ugliness of sin from our lives. Open our eyes to the glorious truth that as your baptized children, we are your priests in this world to carry your world to the ends of the earth for our Savior. Grant your strength and blessing to all the pastors, teachers, and missionaries who serve. May they proclaim your word with fervor and diligence and bring light to those who still sit in darkness. In your mercy, bring help and healing to the sick and the afflicted, especially those who are suffering from COVID-19 right now. By your grace, enable them to cast their care on you, knowing that you care for them. We bring you our prayers also on behalf of Mr. Tim Miller, who was recently called to be the new superintendent at California Lutheran High School. As you have given him this divine call, O Lord, so help him as he considers this call and the call he's currently holding, that he may use the input from others and the counsel from dear friends to make a decision that is pleasing to your kingdom. We pray that you would help him to that end. We also pray today for our dear brother and sister in Christ, Kevin and Veronica Kawada, as they grieve the loss of Kevin's mother, Patsy Kawada, this past week. O oh Lord, as they grieve and the hole that is in them causes them pain, we pray that you would temper that pain with the hope of eternal life, that you would give them confidence in your true promises in your word, that they may daily take comfort as they mourn the loss of a dear loved one. Give them also joy in knowing that she is now with you in heaven, that she has reached her heavenly home and the crown that you have provided for her by your service to us in this world. May we all together rejoice, O Lord, in your Son, Jesus Christ, whom we worship with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and always. Amen. We also pray as our Lord Jesus has taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We conclude our service today with the singing of our final hymn, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It, number 737.
Thank you for joining us for this worship service today here at Torrance, California and Zion Lutheran Church. It's a joy to have you join us. A few reminders for the members of Zion. Please do take a look at the announcements that are in the worship folder for you. Especially note that the Wells Connection for January, there's a link there that you can watch that. Please do so and keep in touch with what's going on in our greater synod that we support with our offerings. Also a reminder that we have Bible class again this Wednesday at 7 o'clock virtually. Watch for links to the study guide and the Bible class during the week. Also, please note that the uh, next Sunday we will be celebrating communion. You will get a notice about that in your emails during this coming week so that you can identify a time from 11 to 12 next Sunday when you could be here to receive that Lord's Supper. And finally, just a reminder to the ladies at 11.30 today, Mary Martha will be meeting virtually. Watch for a link to that shortly before that time. Until we meet again, may God be with you.